Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the rabbit market. The reason why I think this is important is because you have so many commentators, you have so many people in the preparedness circle, you have so many influencers that are constantly railing, complaining, and bitching and moaning about an upcoming food collapse, right? Upcoming starvation, upcoming tribulations, so to speak. And so what they do is they take these concepts, right? And they hammer them, hammer them, hammer them. And then when you ask them for their, you know, for their data, you ask them for their evidence, a lot of times you'll get the Walmart prepper special. What's the Walmart prepper special? It's uh, videos of preppers going into Walmarts and saying that their can of chicken has gone up 60 cents and their macaroni has gone up 40 cents and that crackers are no longer on the shelf and milk is no longer on the shelf and oh look how expensive eggs are and that's how they put two and two together to come up with a you know starvation crisis a doomsday apocalypse food starvation food economic collapse whatever hashtags in the catchphrases you want to you want to put in there and while i personally think that's highly irresponsible um, that doesn't mean that i don't disagree with the notion of upcoming food insecurity and so instead of you know putting my tinfoil hat on and pointing at canned chicken and eggs and mac and cheese, I'm going to take an actual dive into the data. So we're going to look at the raw data and we're going to look at trends that we've seen historically, trends we're seeing currently, and then projections for the future to, de to determine and surmise is this coming food collapse a reality? And what are some of the birthing pains that we should be looking at? What are some of the symptoms that we should be looking at to lead us to a better preparedness posture? So let's get started. If we look at rabbit meat consumption, we can see it goes all the way back to the Paleolithic era, which is approximately 2.5 million years ago, according to the scientists and people that are smart that comes up that come up with these numbers. So human consumption of rabbit has been going on for a very, very long time. And not only that, we can have seen historically where rabbit is the turn to livestock animal for consumption, especially when times are hard, times of starvation. Um, time times that are desperate and if we look at our more recent examples we see in the 1930s with the Soviet Union I mean they literally nationalized around rabbits um, making industry by you know socialism right by the government controlling the means of production producing as many rabbits as humanly possible in order to feed their population um, so we have seen again nationally a nation circumnavigate propaganda around this animal to mass produce it in order to save their their citizenry uh, again we, we've seen it with um, different famines that have happened in China in fact China is the number one producer and consumer of rabbits worldwide and then we've seen for example Venezuela another country where um, the president of Venezuela said you need you guys need to start breeding rabbits um, they're not pets they're food start breeding them if you want to survive and again we're seeing when the, uh, Egypt is one of the top five, I believe it's second second um, in the ranking as far as rabbit meat consumption. If you look at what's going on right now, they're going through economic turmoil. Um, they have, they're have they in an economic crisis. And on top of that, food inflation prices are extremely high. There are people that are starving in Egypt. And so when we start to look at these countries and look at the countries that have really taken on um, rabbit breeding and rabbit consumption, they're countries that are really feeling the effects of food insecurity and really trying to gain a food sovereignty uh, perspective. And so it's very interesting because anytime we see rabbit meat, rabbit production being pushed is because we see that there are underlying political, economic, um, 
causes and reasons for there to be food insecurity. And so one way nations have always, always try to bolster um, keeping their citizens fed is by always turning to the rabbit. So again, this is, again, not my opinion. This is just the factual patterns and trends that we've seen historically. Um, and I would argue for the last 2.5 million years, humans have turned to rabbits to ensure um, their survival. So when we're looking at this, it's very important to understand the why. Why rabbits? What's the big deal about rabbits? I have a whole litter of rabbits in here. There's 11 baby rabbits in here. And I feed them the same way I feed my sheep. And that's with high quality pasture. And that's what I do, I take a big bag of pasture that I mow real quick, throw it in there, it's about 15 pounds of high quality pasture, so that's a little over a pound each. I throw it in there, and if it's all chumped down in a couple hours, I go, mow up another quick bag of pasture, throw it in there. It's so great because it's literally free. One rabbit at eight weeks old will give me about five pounds of high quality meat. So just to give you a size difference here, they grow quick. These rabbits are about just at four weeks old. This rabbit right here is about 11 weeks old. He's gonna be one of our new breeding stock. They grow quick. That's one litter of rabbits. I have seven breeding does. You can do the math on that. Well, I hope this was helpful for you guys. And as always guys, long live the Republic. Most people look at rabbits and they think of, you know, your, your standard pet rabbit. And that's fine. I mean, that's what most people exposure to rabbits are. But when we take a deeper dive into their nutrient density, their ability to produce, their ability to grow on rudimentary feed, i.e. grass, you're going to find that they're a pretty incredible animal that can produce a lot of meat very quickly. So as far as turnaround goes, you could literally take, let's just say you have five breeding does and one buck. So you have five breeding females. You're going to see that every, if you wanted to, you could breed them every month. They, their gestation period is 28 days. Um, they don't have menstrual cycles atypical to what you would see with other animals. Literally every 30 days you can breed a rabbit and every 28 days she can produce, she can produce kits. And so she can have anywhere between seven to 12 kits per litter. At eight weeks old, each rabbit, if you have a good meat rabbit, um, will yield an eight pound animal. So you're looking at literally with five does, hundreds of pounds of meat every month. If you so chose to bread them heavy, that's, that's pretty incredible. Um, and you can do that off nothing but just pasture, nothing but grass. Because that's what they that's what they naturally consume. In fact, when we see rabbits to their own um, devices, like for example in Australia and many parts of the EU, they're considered a pestilence because there's so many of them that the population cannot be controlled. So their ability to produce lots of food with minimum infrastructure is absolutely incredible. And so that's why this animal is always used to pull people out of starvation. Not only that, you're talking about a protein source that has more more protein than red meat, than beef, less fat, high nutrient um, density, right? Both on a micro and macro level, lots of B12 and folic acid. I mean, you're talking about a superfood, essentially. And so the ability for people to get a hold of this kind of quality food at a lower threshold price is pretty incredible. And that's why we see so many countries um, moving towards this, especially those that are having economic problems. Um, in fact, if you look at the Chinese, the Chinese initiatives, they are the number one producer and consumer of rabbits. North Korea is second. Um, Egypt is third. And so when you're looking at these countries that consume a lot of rabbits, is is done because a lot of them are having um, economic issues and food insecurity issues. And so when we look at this pragmatically, we see that all these countries are starting to get on board. Even African countries are looking at it not only as a viable food source for them, but they see the need um, on a global level and they're trying to export um, as many rabbits as possible. So a lot of um, African nations are starting to
put in breeding programs and put in breeding protocols for rabbits in order to mass produce to max export. So again, we're seeing that the world is changing. The world is understanding the food insecurity problems that are out there. And many nations are taking advantage of that by growing and producing as many of them as possible. So what are some of the current trends that we're seeing? Let's take a look. As already discussed, we've seen that lots of nations are starting to prop up and create rabbit breeding programs and rabbit meat infrastructure, um, both for their own in, you know, internal uses and to mass export. And it's really interesting because if we're seeing one of the, the biggest player involved in ensuring that countries are able to breed rabbits, we're seeing that the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative has been huge in that. We'll probably do a video on that um, later, but you can see, you know, China is dumping a lot of money into rabbit infrastructure. If you look at the Russians, they gave them over a hundred million dollars to start the largest breeding rabbit operation that Russia has ever seen. We're also seeing the Chinese invest uh, rabbit infrastructure in a lot of African countries as well. So ch the Chinese is uh, Belt and Road Initiative has been a huge player and the overall global production of rabbits and obviously other commodities as well. But um, as far as rabbit goes, again, there's a reason why there's so much emphasis on rabbits. And again, um, this only goes to show that this is a trend that's shifting. And so if we're looking at what is happening in the current, we see that rabbit meat production globally has gone up significantly. It has gone up um, just the Russians alone, you're talking about 10 to 15 fold increase in, in rabbit production. So all these different nations are coming together and breeding rabbits at an incredible rate. And so what that means, and we'll talk about this a little more, um, but what that means is what they're expecting future projections to be. And future project projections are going to be very important because again, in the current, you're seeing a lot more, you're seeing a lot more rabbit infrastructure being propped up. So what does that mean? It means other um, food commodities are not are not are not uh, being utilized as much, right? So what I'm trying to say is resources, especially in countries like Russia, um, <clears throat> North Korea, not that that matters from the global standpoint, um, Egypt, Mexico, um, different parts of Europe. You're looking at all these countries that are really starting to Russia that are really starting to increase their rabbit production. So they're doing that, and they're allocating resources that would normally go to pigs, cattle, sheep, goats, chicken, poultry. They're taking those resources and they're reinvesting them into the rabbit. So what is that going to say about those other commodity prices? They're going to go up because there's not going to be as much, uh, there's not going to be as many of them produced. Because again, resources are being shifted from these other more mainstream agri agricultural commodities and they're being diverted into rabbit production. So that's what's happening in the now. So what does that mean in the future? So for those of us that are prepared-minded people, what does this information mean to us? And what can we expect to see 
uh, in the future and what part of this is actionable for us? Well, it's very interesting because <clears throat> Oregon, probably the most liberal uh, state in the union, has done something profound. Um, they have actually lifted restrictions on rabbit processing. Um, they are allowing uh, farms to process up to a thousand animals without having any of the um, USDA and FDA licensure and certificates to do so. Again, this is this is game changing. It, it's small in scale, but it's still game changing nonetheless, because even a liberal bastion of liberal ideology like Oregon, of you know, liberal groupthink, understands the importance of food sovereignty and would, the fact that they would even entertain this really begs the question, what are we not seeing? What is the average person not seeing? Why would such a liberal place that's such big into animal rights, in fact, when you look at the most of the animal rights uh, activists, most of the eco-terrorism that, that has happened in this country, a lot of it is in Oregon. And so it's just, it's very interesting that a place that's so liberal understands and recognizes, hey, food insecurity is such a big deal that we're going to go ahead and relax legislation and bureaucracy on people that are producing rabbits. Again, it's it's pretty incredible. Connecticut is trying to do the same thing as well. So when we look at this holistically, we can see that moves are being made. Um, again, who in the who in the U.S. even consumes rabbits? Why is it even a forethought? Why would let why would let legislators even care to entertain this idea? Again, um, that's because those that understand, those that are decision makers, those that have any kind of understanding of where our um, local and global food systems are currently at and what that infrastructure currently is knows that this is the only way again in in a real deep pinch this is going to be the livestock animal that is historically pulled people from the ashes so that's something to look at and again like i've already touched on earlier when we see nation states reallocate resources from typical animal commodities again beef poultry, you know, uh, sheep, goats, etc. When they're pull hogs, when they're pulling resources from these staple commodities and are reallocating them to rabbits, one of a couple of things are going to happen. One, naturally, more rabbits in the market. And two, these commodity prices on these other um, livestock animals are going to go through the roof. And so, again, these are all things that we can expect to see because, again, the numbers are the numbers. I you're seeing the same numbers I'm seeing and we can't we can't change them. So again, that's something to think about as prepared minded individuals. Um, here on the homestead, we we raise rabbits, we raise beef. Um, you've seen all the things that, that we have, you know, sheep, chickens, quail, you know, hogs. We 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 we, we kinda kinda do it all, um, have done it all. And so it's very important because at the end of the day, this is what we're seeing. And again, these are not my thoughts. These are not my opinions. These are just the facts that we're seeing. And sometimes even I get sometimes even I get shocked and surprised. And again, I was not expecting Oregon to um, to do that. And I, I have to give them I have to give them props. Um, I think that was very good. I think it's a little too too little too late, but they're they're doing it. And I hope that in the future they can continue to up and rise the amount of animals that can be processed. Again, you got to take the little wins as you can, but I think every state, my opinion now, I think every state should be enacting these kinds of policies because again, food prices are going up, okay? And I'm not gonna sit here and be like, hey, let's go to Walmart and start looking at all the prices. No, we can see from a big agricultural shift that prices are gonna go up and they're gonna continue to go up. And so you as prepared-minded individuals, I highly encourage you to look at what your options are because again, this train is rolling and there's nothing that any of us can do to stop it. So when the train comes through, where are you going to be? Where are you postured at? Um, what solution based preps have you, have you prepared? And are you ready for what's coming? Again, I can't answer that for you. Only you can. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. Um, I've had a few people reach out to me wondering if I'd ever go live and do a Q and A. If you guys are interested in that, let me know in the comment section below. Um, I haven't thought about doing it because, you know, obviously it's a smaller channel, but if th those of you would be interested in a Q&A with me, um, let me know in the comment section below. We can definitely make something, we can definitely make something happen. So let me know if that's something you'd want to do in the future. And again, if you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. 
If you have any questions about my evidence and my data, it's always linked in the description box there. So take a look at them. And as always, guys, long live the Republic.